Hi and welcome! So in this video, we're going to talk through solving trigonometric equations, this time using identities. So I'm going to put all of our identities up here on the screen, at least the ones that we have so far. So we have the definitions for our six trigonometric functions, and then we also have now our Pythagorean identities. So all of these identities are available for you to use when you're solving trigonometric equations. So I'll be referring back to these identities without really reminding you of them on the screen. So you might want to have them for yourself. Maybe you already have them in some notes or you have something else you're referencing, or you could take a screenshot of this right now in order to get these identities. Or if you're in my class, these are in the notes that I have provided. And before we get into the examples, I just really want to reiterate that there are so many variations of what these types of problems might look like that I can't possibly show you all of the examples. So I'm going to show you three examples here and show you some different ways of solving them, but just know that when you get to doing these on your own, they're gonna maybe look a little different and it might take a few minutes of you trying some things out, doing some different things, playing around with it, and that's okay. So it just takes a little bit of experience and practice to get faster at these. And sometimes you even just get lucky by picking the right technique the first time around. But just know that it's not saying anything about how much you know or how good you are at math. It's really just that we're learning this for the first time and it often requires some extra problem solving and just some extra time of playing around with the ideas. Okay, I also want to just give you a math tip and some suggestions for solving. So the math tip is that if you end up in your problem with a over b equals x over y, so basically just like one fraction equals another fraction, you can flip each part of the fraction over. So you can write this as b over a equals y over x. So sometimes you have a fraction written one way and you really kind of wish that you had the reciprocals and you can just do that. So the reason why isn't very interesting, it just involves a lot of multiplying, but basically you can just multiply everything around and divide properly in order to get the fractions the other way. Or you can think of these as ratios. So if a is to b, as x is to y, it would make sense that you could say b is to a as y is to x. So there are lots of ways to think through this, but the main idea is that if you have two fractions and they're equal to each other, you can just look at their reciprocals as equal as well. We'll use this in our first example so you can see what I'm talking about. But before we get there, I just wanna give you one suggestion. So as you're solving these, I would recommend trying to write everything in terms of sine, cosine, or tangent, and have the goal of only using one type of trig function in the equation. So this might not always work, but I think this is a good standard way to approach these problems. You want to try to use sine, cosine, or tangent, so end up getting there. And it's going to be good if you have a mixed set of trig functions to try to get them all the same. So try to use all sine, all cosine, or all tangent. Okay, let's try some of these things on an example. So let's solve square root of 3 times cotangent of x equals 1 for all solutions of x in the interval from 0 to 2 pi. So again, in all of these examples, we will just be finding the solutions in one rotation of the circle, so just from 0 to 2 pi. So in these problems, we're going to follow a very similar path that we've done in the past with these. So I'm going to try to isolate the trig function first. I'm going to get cotangent equals 1 over square root of 3. And then I'm going to use my suggestion of getting this in terms of sine, cosine, or tangent. So cotangent is harder for me personally to look at a unit circle or a reference triangle and work with. So I'm going to try to change this to a tangent since I know cotangent is related to tangent. So what I can do is I can write cotangent as 1 over tangent. And so I have 1 over tangent equals 1 over square root of 3. Now I'm going to use my rule about my fractions being equal. So I'm going to swap these and instead I'm going to write this as tangent of x over 1 equals square root of 3 over 1. And I'm doing this because when we divide by 1, it doesn't affect it. So we just have tangent of x equals square root of 3 of x. And now I've taken the original problem that started with a cotangent and I've rewritten it in terms of tangent, which is easier for me to solve and looks like a problem we've done previously. So for tangent, I like to use the reference triangles. 
So tangent is opposite over adjacent. So looking at the pi over three triangle here, I have opposite over adjacent. And so this tells me that I'm going to have pi over three as one of my solutions. And then I'm also going to need the angle where tangent is positive. So tangent is also positive in quadrant three. And so that's the four pi over three angle. We're basically adding pi to get that other solution since pi is the period. There's lots of ways to think through this. Basically, you just need to get the first two solutions. And so we have pi over three and four pi over three. So there we go. For our next example, let's solve cosine squared of theta equals sine of theta minus one for all solutions theta in the interval from zero to two pi. So when I look at this, I try to remember back to some of my advice that I gave you and that I always give myself, which is that we'd really like this to only have one type of trig function. So it'd be really great if they were all cosine or they were all sine. And so in my mind, I'm thinking of that as my goal. So if I wanted to change the sine to be a cosine, I kind of don't know how I would do that. So we know that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, or we know that sine is one over cosecant, but I don't really have an identity that relates it directly back to cosine. However, if I look at the cosine squared, I do have an identity that lets me write this in terms of a sine squared, and that's my Pythagorean identity. So because this one has a squared, I'm going to try to start here and then write this in terms of sine. So my identity is that cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, and I can solve for cosine squared. So cosine squared is one minus sine squared if I just subtract that sine squared over. So I'm kind of taking a step back from my problem and I'm looking at my identities and reworking the identity to do what I want it to here. So I'm going to take that cosine squared that's on the left-hand side and now replace it with this new thing I've found. So this is the original. We have cosine squared equals sine of theta minus one. That's the equation I was given. And now I'm going to use my identity to rewrite the cosine squared as one minus sine squared. And so now I have a new equation. I have one minus sine squared equals sine minus one. Now I have an equation that has only signs in it, and I can work with just this and solve. So this first step we've done is really just converting it to a single type of trig function. We've used an identity to write this just in terms of sign. So now what I'm gonna do is just work on bringing everything to one side of the equation so that I have something like zero equals. So I'm gonna take the sine squared on the left-hand side and add it to the right-hand side. Then I'm going to subtract the one from the left-hand side and move it to the right-hand side. So I'm left with zero equals sine of theta minus one. Then I have plus sine squared of theta and then minus one. Then if I combine like terms, basically combining those ones, I'm left with zero equals sine squared of theta plus sine of theta minus two. Now at this point, if you are struggling with all of the trig functions that are happening, you could have change sine into like an X. So we could think of this as zero equals X squared plus X minus two, and then work on that problem. And so really, once you get everything in terms of one trig function, you can replace the trig function with a variable if that helps you out. So here, if I think of X squared plus X minus two, I can factor this a little more easily than just looking at the signs. So to factor this, I need two numbers that multiply to negative two, but add to one. And so I'm thinking that's a positive two and a negative one. So I'm going to have X plus two, X minus one. And when I replace this with signs, I have that zero equals a sine of theta plus two times sine of theta minus one. And so in this problem, I'm actually using identities and factoring. So I used an identity to get everything in terms of one trig function, and now I'm factoring. We have these two factors and they multiply to get zero. So that tells me that one of the factors is equal to zero. So I can set each part equal to zero. I have zero equals sine of theta plus two, and I have zero equals sine of theta minus one. Then solving for sine of theta, I have sine of theta equals negative two, and I have sine of theta equals one. And these are just now two separate equations that we need to find solutions for. 
All right, so starting first with sine of theta equals negative two, I need to remember that the regular standalone sine function only has outputs between negative one and one. So if you think of the graph, it just bounces between negative one and one. Or if you think of the unit circle, it doesn't really go outside of that circle of radius one. And so this equation here with the negative two actually has no solutions. So there are no angles I can give the regular sine function to give me a negative two. If I transformed the sine function, there would be some, but we're just working with sine of theta. And so this doesn't have any angles that give me a negative two, so there are no solutions. Then for the other equation, sine of theta equals one, on my unit circle, I know that this happens at pi over two, so that y value is one at pi over two, and that's my sign. So my solution here is pi over two. And this is actually my only solution. So theta equals pi over two is my solution to this problem. So a lot of work to get me here, but this is my final answer. Okay, so I'm going to show you one last example, and this one is going to have two different ways to solve it, and so I'm gonna show you both. In many cases, these problems have multiple ways of solving, but they should all lead to the same final answer. Okay, so we're going to solve the equation tangent squared of phi plus one equals two. And as I mentioned, there are at least two ways to solve this, maybe more. I'm just going to show you two different methods. So our first method is that we're just going to leave everything in terms of tangent, but then the other method is that we're going to use the a Pythagorean identity in order to simplify. So either method is totally fine, it's just really up to what maybe you see when you look at this or what you feel more comfortable with. Sometimes you might work on one way of solving and you get kind of stuck, like something's not making sense, and so you can go back and try something else. Okay, so for our first method, I'm going to leave everything in terms of tangent, and so I'm going to try to isolate for tangent. So we're going to get the tangent squared by itself by subtracting one from the right-hand side, and so I'm getting tangent squared of phi equals one. Then to isolate the tangent, I'm going to take the plus or minus square root of both sides, and so I'm getting that tangent of phi equals plus or minus the square root of one. The square root of one is just one, and so I have my two equations using that plus or minus. I have tangent of phi equals positive one, and I have tangent of phi equals negative one. So from here, I just have two equations that I need to solve. So basically, I'm just looking for all of the places where we get a tangent value of positive or negative one, and this is going to happen at the pi over four angles, since both the x and the y are the same at those locations. So for the positive one, this happens in quadrant one and quadrant three. So my angles are phi equals pi over four and five pi over four. Then for the negative one, this happens in quadrant two and four. And so this is three pi over four and seven pi over four. Or you could really just jump to writing them as all one list. We're just looking for all of the angles where we get a tangent value of either positive one or negative one. And so this is phi equals pi over four, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4. Okay, so this is our first method for solving. I just want to show you another way we could do this, and we should get the exact same answer. So when I look at this problem and I see a tangent squared, I immediately think of the Pythagorean identity, because we have an identity for tangent squared. So actually, tangent squared of phi plus 1 is the identity and it's equal to secant squared of phi. So I can really take this left-hand side and replace it with secant squared of phi, and I have that this is equal to two. And now I could solve this problem instead. So secant is one over cosine, so I'm gonna write this in terms of cosine since that's easier for me. So I have one over cosine squared equals two, and then I just need to isolate the cosine. So I'm gonna do some manipulation here. I'm going to move the cosine squared over by multiplying it. So I have one equals two cosine squared of phi, and then I'll divide by two. So I have one half equals cosine squared of phi. Now be careful, you might be tempted to just stop here since you see a one half and you know that's on the unit circle, but we still have a squared. So we need to take the plus or minus square root. So I'm getting that cosine of phi equals plus or minus the square root of one half. 
So at this point, you might be thinking like, hey, Claire, this is a lot. This is more than method one. And it totally is. I just kind of want to show you because maybe you don't realize that you could do method one. And when you're doing these problems, you start on method two. And that's totally okay. When you're starting the problem, you might not really know which one is faster. You might just think of a method and want to follow it through. So that's why I'm showing you both. Okay, so back to our problem. I'm going to do a little side work to simplify the square root of one half. So I can write it as the square root of one over the square root of two. The square root of one is just one. And then I'm going to rationalize this just because I'm thinking this is on my unit circle. So I'm gonna multiply both the numerator and the denominator by square root of two. And those square root of twos in the denominator cancel out to give me just two. And so I'm left with square root of two over two. So all of this because I can now write this as cosine of phi equals plus or minus the square root of two all over two. This gives me two equations. So I have cosine of phi equals positive square root of two over two and cosine of phi equals negative square root of two over two. I can look at my unit circle now and I'm seeing that this is all of the places where the cosine value is either plus or minus the square root of two over two, which is the same angles we found in method one. So it's pi over four and seven pi over four for a positive cosine and it's three pi over four and five pi over four for a negative cosine. And then we could write these all out as one list and we're getting the same solution for method two. So, okay, hopefully this reinforces for you that there are multiple ways to do these problems. You just need to trust that you do know what you're doing. You just have some basic skills that you can rely on. You can rely on your factoring or using your identities. And you can remember our suggestions of trying to get everything in terms of one trig function and to use sine, cosine, or tangent whenever you can, because we can use the unit circle or our reference triangles really easily for those trig functions. That's it for this one. Thanks so much for watching and I will talk to you in the next one.